Well, hello and welcome to yet another video where we are learning more about FileMaker. My name is Matt Petrowski. I'm the editor over at ISO FileMaker Magazine. You'll find that at FileMakerMagazine.com. In this video, what we're going to take a look at is the on object exit script trigger. And we're taking care of our time tracking database. Hang with me, we'll be on my desktop in just a few. Alrighty, welcome back to yet another video where we are learning more and more about FileMaker. Now, first off, I'll give you the disclaimer. I am using a copy of FileMaker 16. The file that I'm going to point you to in the description below, in fact, if you wanna follow along, it's probably the easiest way to do so, is going to be, you can open that with FileMaker 14 or higher, and that's because I'm using uh, button bars and a number of things that are only available in FileMaker 14. I have, I have had a couple of comments about FileMaker 13, and uh, unfortunately, I'm just going with features that are in 14 and higher. But a lot of what you learn in, the, in these videos will work in FileMaker 13. In fact, it's one of the reasons that we will make the decision that we're going to make today. Now, also, if you are if you found this video and it's uh, I think 26 right now, if you're interested in following these in series, going all the way back to number one, and there's a couple other series that I've done, I'm breaking these down into just what I consider major areas of FileMaker. Click on the channel icon here on YouTube, and that'll take you to the various playlists where you can start and just go in order one, two, three, four, and so forth. So as I zoom in here, I'll need to switch, make sure I'm in FileMaker, and make sure my hands are on the right keys. I already have a copy of the database open. You of course can download this. Again, it's in the description down below and you'll be able to access the file that we're working with, this one right here, Time Track. Now it's ugly as all get out, but we are going to be fixing that. In fact, starting towards the middle or the end of this week, we're going to be looking at user interface and cleaning things up. Now this time track database, what happens is as you start to create a FileMaker solution, you come across situations where you create problems for yourself. In fact, that's exactly what I've done. Now I have these two buttons here on this file, projects and projects, and they're both doing the same thing. We went through a couple of lessons ago, implementing one, this one right here, which uses a popover object, and that's gonna work in FileMaker 14 and higher. Our card windows, which is when I click on this projects, is only going to be available in FileMaker 16 and higher, which is what I'm working with right now, but if you don't have a copy of FileMaker 16, then this won't work, and so I'm going to choose not to use this method. Although I will say, this method, probably using FileMaker 16 and higher, is probably the preferred method because it has a lot less that goes into adding to the database. This is simply just directly on the button that we have right here. When we go into layout mode and we double click on the button, we can see that we're just using a straight up single step and we're using a new window of a, of a card style. So if you have a copy of FileMaker 16, then I'm going to suggest that you go with that. For right now, I'm just going to get rid of that off of the layout because we're going to be using the popover that we have right here. Now the problem that we have in this file that we have created for ourselves, and a lot of the times when you're working with FileMaker, your goal is to implement the structure but also plan your user interface so that one, it's usable and the users enjoy using it so they use the software, but also two, you sort of have to know what are the shortcomings that you have in the environment that cause you to work around certain issues such as this. When we go into browse mode, we can see first off the problem, there's a couple of problems that we've created in this file when we choose to use this method. The first problem that we have is down here you can see that it's showing my big project, which just happens to be one of the other projects in here. I currently have an established relationship that needs to be broken, but the whole goal is being able to allow the user to select in this area and be able to create a new project, sort of an all-in-one place where the user can manage which projects are active, uh, create new projects, and delete projects if they wanted to, all within this popover. So we're going to choose that over the card window. But the one issue that we're going to focus on for this video is the fact that 
we can make a project active or inactive, and we have our popover right here, which allows us to load a given project. Now, in this file, I believe as it's provided, I do have some records, and they're all associated to project number seven. So if you select project seven, they, uh, those records should load. Otherwise, if you don't have records that load, what happens is when you click this start button, whatever project is selected, that's it will create uh, record timestamp records for that particular project or open records, which you can then close. So we have this issue where if I disable project seven right now and say this is no longer an active project, and as soon as I close or get out of this dialog or this popover, I call it a dialog for some reason, we can see that we get this funky rendering right here where FileMaker now displays the keys. Now throughout this series, I've been promoting that you use UUIDs. You almost never display them to the user. They are for you as the developer behind the scenes. You know that nobody is able to access those. Doesn't mean that you don't use uh, parallel serial keys or something that means something to a user, like an incrementing invoice number or something to that effect, but we need to take care of this. And it's a pretty common thing when you're going to deal with a value list that's dynamically driven based on some type of criteria. And if you don't remember the lesson, let's take a quick look at where this value list is being driven from. In fact, Let's start at the value list. That's always the easiest. If you're learning FileMaker and you get a, a copy of a database, something that somebody developed, backtracing your way into how something is structured is usually starts at the object of what you're wanting to work with. So I know that I've got a value list right here. And the I guess the full course would be to select this object, then look at the inspector, look at the fourth area, the data tab, look at the control style, which is a pop-up menu, and see that the values are coming from projects. Now, I was going to head over to the, fi uh, to the file menu and access value lists there, but we can access it right here, and we can see that projects, the list of projects, is a related value list, and it is coming from the values project ID. It is returning the ID field, and it's showing the name field, and that's because of our second option right here, or our, not our second option, but our option of showing values only from the second field. So when we use certain widget types, FileMaker shows the name, but we can see quite clearly that it uses the ID. So our goal is to get an ID of an active record or choose some other alternative. We notice that what happens is when that value is taken out of the value list, and we did that if we go look at our values value lists, which happen to be right here. Our value list is, has been extracted, as we learned in a previous lesson, has been extracted out of our graph that is representing our data structure. Our data structure is being represented by our table occurrences right here. We have some user interface table occurrences right here, not including this one. We decided to put the value list out of that structure because it makes it easier for us to manage our graph. So we can see that this is based on this field of active and only those values are going to be active. So we're going to walk through a couple of options that we can use in order to solve this because I want you to learn and know what you can do in FileMaker, not just do the one thing that I show you. So the first thing that we have as an option is using the on object exit script trigger. Um, well, that's what we're going to implement. There are many options that we can take within FileMaker, but when we take this option, I've already showed you in the previous video that we have the ability to put a script trigger on an object by either right clicking and choosing script triggers or my favorite, holding down the command key or the control key if you're on Windows and simply double clicking on the object. Now when it comes with pop comes up to popovers, we we know that this is a popover object. We can always look at our inspector by going to the appearance tab. That's the third tab, and we can see what an object is by seeing this right here. It's the only place in FileMaker where you can see what an object is. If I select a field, FileMaker will tell me it's an edit box. If I select this field, it'll tell me that it's a pop-up menu. So this is the only location where you can see whether something is a button or something else. So because this is a button, if I hold down the command key and double click, I'm getting the script triggers for the button. 
not for the popover. Every object in FileMaker is separate. So I need to explicitly click this two times to reveal the popover, then select the popover, then hold down the command key or right click on the popover and choose set script triggers. So there's a big difference between setting a script trigger on the actual button versus setting it on the popover. So now when I double click or command double click, we can see that I'm doing one thing right here that is an on object exit. Now I probably added this in a previous video, but this is a good opportunity for us to now make this process specific to this popover. So we are going to do that. We're going to zoom out here and we are going to create a new script. Now this is something that I do in a lot of the way that I program a FileMaker solution. It is very easy to get confused over the long haul when you add a bunch of stuff to FileMaker. And the easiest way for me to associate a script trigger is by naming the script the same thing as the script trigger and then just giving it some type of identification as to what area it applies. So when I create this new script, I'm going to call this script on object, I'm going to spell it right, exit, and I will call this now project, popover. Now by giving it this prefix, it makes it very easy for me to select this when I'm choosing to associate it by uh, assigning the script to wherever I'm doing it, script triggers, buttons, what have you. But also, I like to organize all of my script triggers in a folder. So as I save this, I have this folder called user interface. And currently, I haven't started my major organization, but we're going to do a nice little sidebar right now and start to create this. So first off, I create a folder that represents the layout where these object where these scripts are going to directly tie to. So um, I'm going to call this time capture. I don't know what I've got it called right now. Right now it's called layout time. Um, I tend to call my user interface, uh, I think of them in terms of their area of use. It might make the most sense if this was a super complex FileMaker solution to actually call this layout time and have a one-to-one -one correlation where the name of the layout correlates to the folder where I'm specifically going to hold scripts that only operate in that context on this layout. Um, I'll leave that as is for right now, but I'm going to make yet another folder called triggers. And I do that just because I like to have my script organization in a manner such that all of the scripts that only belong to that layout are within that particular folder. But then you have anything that's specific to sub objects like tabs, popovers, what have you, they may get their own folder if I end up with a lot of scripts. And when it comes to triggers, I like to put the triggers in the triggers. So right now I should uh, probably move some of these. I forget which ones I, Closed session is probably one, adjust is one. So this is how it works for me. I have the user interface, each layout where the user can interact gets its own folder. That folder then has a subfolder of triggers. It's usually up towards the top. And then I have all of the scripts that are specific to that layout. So that's our little sidebar there with about organization. I'll probably go over it again in the scripting session. But with our on object popover now, I can wrap the different operations that I had in that particular script. One of them was this simple command. There's two ways I could add this. I could simply copy the step, or if this particular script did something that I wanted that had more steps than just a commit, I would choose to put a perform script in that on object popover. In other words, I wouldn't just put this specific step, which I'm going to do right now with a copy and then paste to make sure that I have the steps that were there before, after I reassign. But I would simply do a perform script that would call this script if it was more complex. So let's go wire it up now. So on our popover, I hold down the command key, I double click. I can see that formerly I was calling the commit script. I've now taken care of moving those same steps into my on object exit. And this is what makes it so easy. I go to my application, I go to my user interface, I'm on my layout, and I look for my triggers. And that's why I choose to organize things because it makes it very easy for me to make that mental correlation of what's going on. So I choose on object exit 
pop over. And we say, okay. All right, so now that that is assigned to this particular object, what we need to do is we need to make a decision about our user interface. And I don't like the change that it made here by realigning my popover. There is a little uh, trick in FileMaker that if you click and then uh, sometimes if you click, my clicker sometimes isn't working, but if you click and I believe option drag or something, you can drag it around and reorient which is the same thing as double clicking the button that is the popover and choosing the orientation right here. And of course, FileMaker will only show these based on the available space. So what we need to do is make a decision now. What do we want to have happen when this popover closes and the, object, the particular project is no longer active? Now, as I stated at the very beginning, we have multiple ways that we can choose to do this. And I'm going to give you two that we can choose from, and then I'm going to show you the ultimate option that I'm going to choose. Now, one of them is before this popover closes, what happens is I just changed the state of one of the objects out of all of the objects that are in this particular portal. And whenever we're referencing a portal, we can always look at the bottom of the portal and see where the data is coming from. So in this case, the data is coming from portal all projects. So we're going to take a look at what we can see through portal all projects. We can do that with the data viewer. I highly suggest you use FileMaker uh, Advanced if you can. Because what we want to do is we want to do one of two things. We either want to give the user a nice message, which I'm going, that's what I'm going to prefer to do, or we want to select the next available active project or the first available project. So we're going to see the two ways that we can do this. The first one is when this popover closes, we have a list right here of the remaining active projects, but we have to think, is it possible that we could have no active projects? And then we have to solve for that issue. And that's basically what programming in FileMaker is, making your user interface do what you want it to do based on how you've structured the data. Well, let's just grab a list of all of the active projects. There's two ways that we can do this. The first is we can look at that portal which I just mentioned, and see that we can look at all of the active projects through Portal All. And now that one's a little bit more difficult to do, but let's go ahead and try. I'm going to go to my tools and choose my data viewer. It's the easiest way when you're working with FileMaker Advanced to not have to create a FileMaker calculation and look at what's going on. Now I'm going to go to the watch section, I'm going to click the little plus, and I'm going to now select my context, which it was at the bottom of that portal, portal all projects. And you might be thinking, I can look at all of these projects and I can get a list of all of these items. List of whatever I want to look at. List of all of the IDs. And so what we'll see is portal all in this particular case isn't really going to give us what we want. And that makes sense. Let's go ahead and take a look at our Manage database. We always have to reference and think about what's going on in FileMaker. Well, we're on our context of layout time and we're going through a globals, which is based on a selected project. We can see that it's a Cartesian join, which basically means show me everything. Then that is related to the portal all projects, which is show me everything. So this isn't going to give me what I want in terms of what's active versus what's not active. Well, it could actually give me that. There's an advanced uh, FileMaker technique where I would be able to use a custom function called custom list, where I would be able to look at this right here. So what I did is I simply used a list to double click and look through that portal all, looking at all projects, looking at just the contents of the active field. So here it gives me a list. Uh, this one's one, this one's one, this one. So these are my active projects, but I don't have the associated data that would come with it. So my reason for showing you this is this is an advanced way to look through a portal where you would be able to, if you, you take the time to learn the custom list custom function, you would be able to look at all of the data and look at more than one field. Um, it would be really nice if the list would be able to do this right here, um, add those, and show us both pieces of information 
for the whole list. But the list function doesn't work like that. The list function can only list the contents of all related values for one field. And that's a bummer. It would really be nice if FileMaker would let us get a list of both of them. You can see that as soon as I added that second field, FileMaker did return two pieces of information, but because of how FileMaker relationships work, it's only grabbing the first record. So it is giving me the state, the active status of the first record, and it's giving me the ID when I pass both of those. So that's not going to work for us in this solution, but I want you to be aware of the fact that it exists. It is possible to do. You just have to go into the world of a custom function. So now let's take a look at another way that we can get this data and understand how we're getting the data. Let's go back to our manage database. Right now, our user interface is showing a list through this table of current structure of these relationships of all projects. And that's what we want to be able to see. We want to see all the projects so that we can choose which ones we want active and non-active. But we also have the value list itself. Now the value list is giving us a list of the active projects. But the value list, as we can see, is disconnected over here and really doesn't have anything to do with our graph in terms of our current perspective or our context. Our context is right here and we can see whatever we can see over here, but we can still use information from this disconnected table occurrence group, which is creating our value lists. So let's see how we can do that. There is, in FileMaker, a nice suite of functions which are the design functions right here. Now these design functions were implemented for the use, uh, it came right about, I think FileMaker 5, a lot of these design functions came. And what they give you is meta information about FileMaker. And one of those meta pieces of information happens to be value list items and value list names. So let's play with these. Let's get the value list name, and currently I forget what the name of the item is, but you can see that if we put in double quotes, value list names will return a list of all of your value lists that you have in this file. So I can take projects here and copy this and now pass that into the value list items function. So I'm going to uh, add value list items here. And I'm just going to copy and borrow this because I already put this right here. And you can see that it wants the value list and the file name. Well, just like I did with the value list items or the value list names, I'm going to pass in a blank for the file name, meaning the current file name. You could likewise actually uh, use when FileMaker has this file name value right here, all you have to do is put a parenthesis, go to the front, type in get, put another parenthesis, and it will return the same thing. But remember, the double quotes returns the current file. So, lo and behold, this value list items is giving me a list of all of my active values. So, what could I do? I could just take the topmost value off of this list and put that into the field. And let's see what that would look like. I would use the get value function. And what I did there is I simply copied out, this is the way that you build FileMaker calculations. You build parts of the function from the inside out piece by piece. First, what did I need? I needed the value list. Second, what do I want once I get all of the list of values from that value list, which happen to only be returning the active? Well, I paste that having cut it to the clipboard right in there, and I say I want value number one. So there is the key of the values, according to what the value lists return, of all currently active items, so that when I close this dialog with the on object exit, I'm going to simply use this logic to say, okay, I know that the value list, that or the value that I used is no longer active, now I'm going to uh, basically set a new value. But as we're going to see, we're really only solving half of the problem right now. So having created that code in the data viewer, we can close the data viewer and go edit our script. So there's our script right there. We are dealing with not the commit, but we are dealing with this on object exit popover script that we created. 
And what are we going to do? Super simple, we're just going to set our field. What is our field? Well, we can see right here, it's our global field. We're going to target that, which happens to be, and again, if you get confused, you can always go to Manage Database. Globals is the context that I want. Uh, discard my changes. I want Globals right there, and I want the selected project to be what I just composed in the Data Viewer. Right there. I want you to look at the value list items. The value list is the projects. Projects is only going to return active projects, and I want you to get the topmost value. But here's the problem that we have. By having this just be this default script, that basically when we close it, we haven't determined whether or not the current selected project is one that we made active versus inactive. We're just solving the immediate problem that we know we've created by the fact that it's possible that the value in the selected project could have been made inactive and will now show a bogus value. So long story short, we're gonna solve this in a better way much more simple way, but I wanted you to understand that you could do this. First, you can look across a portal, and if you use a custom function like custom list custom function, you'll have to go learn about that. I have a lot of videos on the magazine website about it. It allows you to look at multiple fields, like we were trying to do with the list function, and based on one of those values, extract whatever data you want. I love that function. This one is a more native approach where we're saying, FileMaker, give me the values from a value list, and I'm just gonna take one of those and put it right into place. So this is fun to see. Let's go ahead and save that and see if it works. We're going to go into browse mode now as I zoom out. We'll go into the database, we will browse. Let's select a project like project five. We will click on our projects. Let's make project five inactive. And now when we drop out, what I'm expecting to have happen is it should select project two. Because according to the value lists function, the design function, it's going to get a list of all of those values. And I think it puts them in alpha order. And when I exit out of this, I got my big project. But we can see that we did solve the problem, but we've only half solved the problem as I told you. We would now need to determine that on that exit, we need to look at the ID and determine whether that ID exists within the value lists. Um, we can take a look at that, but let me show you really quickly the best solution that I think will solve this UI problem. First off, the problem that we're solving, we have to ask ourselves from a user interface standpoint, does it even make sense that if we have a number of projects that are active, that when one of those projects is selected, project two, what have you, that when the user comes in and they make project two inactive, does it make sense that we get rid of this selection? Because we're solving a problem that's an error, it's an issue with FileMaker, and the issue is that the values that FileMaker wants to show as part of a value list must exist in that value list, and we're taking the value out of the value list, so FileMaker decides all of a sudden, well, because this is no longer a value in that value list, I'm just going to show you the raw contents of that field. That gives us a clue. The easiest way to solve this problem is to simply just give the user a prompt. If the value is no longer available as part of the value list, why go through all of the hassle of taking the time to go get the value list, determine whether the value that is currently in there is one that happened to be made inactive, and then replace it with something that is a valid active value, when probably the best solution is this right here. Now we can put that uh, code in there that I was talking about, the where we determine whether the value is a value that was made inactive or in uh, or you know taken out of the value list. But the easiest solution is this right here. I'm going to comment that because I want to keep the code, duplicate it, uncomment, and I could have done the reverse right there. But I'm simply going to set the global field to something super simple. I know that FileMaker, if it's not a valid value, is just going to show the raw text. Make a selection, dot, dot, dot. In other words, a prompt right there. Now we're still going to need to make that determination. But this, in my opinion, is going to be the better 
method rather than just putting another project because the context for the user was I was working with project two. I just made it inactive. Why are you not showing me? I selected project two. Why are you showing me project five or project seven or project nine? I didn't select project seven or project nine or whatever the first project of the value list was. So this, in my opinion, is better to say, just go ahead and make a selection. But again, I need to determine whether or not the value is no longer valid. So let's solve that problem. Now let's, let's see if this will work as part of our solution. Well, it will because on object exit, when this uh, popover is being exited, we are committing the records and then no matter what, we are setting the field right here. So we get out and it says make a selection. So now let's determine whether or not the value is made, uh, is a value that is no longer part of the value list. And we're building here, we have to use the knowledge that we already had with that value list. So let's go find out. We can do that within our data viewer. I am going to make sure that project two is active and I'm going to select project two and we are now going to use our data viewer to solve this problem because we already have the code in the data viewer. We've got our value list or our, we're using our get value right there. We'll take off the get value and get our value list. So this is one of my most favorite ways to find out whether a value exists or not. There's a couple of ways that you can determine whether a value exists. The first way is to simply do a pattern count. When you look for a string of text as a pattern within uh, some other text, you get a nice result. You get whether it exists or not. So let's take a look at that one. So within our text, what is our text? We can cut that and put this right here. We put our pattern count of our values. What is our search string? Our search string is whatever exists in the globals currently of the selected project. So that right there is going to tell us when we exit, if the value in the globals field selected project does exist as a pattern, as a string within the list of the active values, then we know that it's okay. We don't really have to make the user make that. Uh, we don't have to make the UI switch to say, make a selection because it was made inactive. But there's also another way. There's so many ways to do things in FileMaker. This is um, the way it's a little bit more complex, but um, we'll, we'll probably go with pattern count in this one. But filter values is another way that you can determine whether or not a value is within a list or not. And you can then uh, use an additional function on that. I guess one function is probably better than two, but I don't know. It's always nice to know multiple ways to solve things. So value list items, you look at what's your text that you want to filter based on and what are your filter values. Sometimes it doesn't matter which order you do these in when you're trying to filter values. But um, look at the description of the function in order to determine when it is important. In this case, the filter values and the text to filter based on will give me a result. Now, here's how we I like to deal with this as I hide this so that we can see the functions in their nice glory. We can look at the distinction. Pattern count, when we comment this particular function, is saying yes or no, this value exists. It's returning a Boolean value. If you don't want the Boolean value, you want to know what is the value, that's where filter values is going to tell you whether or not it exists. So in this case, filter values is returning the ID that it finds in the global field provided that it's within the list of active values. And sometimes that's helpful to know. If I wanted to switch this particular function into whether or not it exists, all I have to do is wrap around an is empty. Because obviously if this, if this field was empty, um, then why is it showing me a one? Because that's not true. Filter values. Oh, I would need to switch that to a not is empty. So we're going into a little bit more convoluted logic there. That's why I'm probably going to go for simplicity with pattern count. Now, why use filter values over pattern count sometimes? This all comes down to uh, the performance of the calculation. In this scenario, 
performance is not a concern. This is such a minor, minor thing that I don't even know if you'd be able to find the performance difference between the two. But it's always good to know about your multiple options. So we will use pattern count right now in order to make that determination. Again, building your logic within your data viewer and being able to move around is a really nice way to work in FileMaker. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to now just monitor that, hide my data viewer, and go back to my script. So now is when we get to decide what we're going to do. Now I've got a lot of great uh, content that I'll be covering for you in the scripting section where the way that I would develop, I'd do the whole thing within one set field. But it makes it a little bit easier for us to just put our code in an if condition right here. We may need to flip it up, but um, remember we are going to say now here's the great thing. There's so many ways that we could do this and I should probably come back, but we're at 35 minutes right now. Um, I like to keep these within that 40 minute range. Um, I think I'm going to need to switch this. But again, there's so many ways that we could uh, code this up, this little piece of logic. We could ultimately only have two steps, but we're going to have the four. If we do not get a pattern count, meaning if the value that we see in the global field selected does not match a pattern or does not match a given string within the list of value lists that say that they're active, then we need to say make a selection. So it's those few steps right here. But here's the key thing with value lists. Remember, if you have problems with value lists, it's very often because the value list or the change to what would affect the value list has not been affected until a commit has actually been set to the database. So in other words, when I check that button of active versus inactive, if I don't commit, FileMaker will still probably operate off of the old value list until the records are written to the database and then FileMaker updates the value list and then I make my determination. So this commit in this particular scenario is a very important step. So let's see if this works. We'll save our script and we will go into projects and with project two, I'm going to try making project four inactive and project two should stay selected because it is still an active. So when I get out, good, project two stays selected. So now let's go in and I'll make project two, uh, four active again. Now I'll make project two inactive and let's see if we solved the problem where when I get out of this, it's no longer an active value and shouldn't be available and FileMaker would default to that ugly UUID. I don't want it to. Instead, I want it to say nicely make a selection. So now project two is no longer added and we've just learned a lot of cool little lessons here in this video about how we can make a really nice UI, make the UI work, but do it in conjunction with knowing other things like the value list items functions, learning whether something is in a value in a list or not using pattern count, filter values, all kinds of really nice things. And that nice little fix right there has given us a great little solution. I'm gonna leave the code here. You'll get the file in the upload uh, for the video tomorrow. And I hope this has helped you out in terms of being able to make your FileMaker solution that much better. There's a lot of times where things drop in and out of your FileMaker solution and knowing how to address those problems is a really cool thing. All right, so let's see if we have got any, uh, I can see we've got a number of questions that have come in here or um, maybe they're just comments about things. Let's scroll up here. All right, we've got our good mornings. All right, Rana, yeah, we're gonna have to get some of your questions answered, aren't we? Because this is on a, a very complex, specific, um, I think not something necessarily specific to our lesson here, but specific to a problem you're trying to solve. Again, the best way is send that file, and I, get, I have a number of people sending me files based on all the people who watch this, not just the people in the chat. The best way I've described it, I'll, I can put, put a link in the video, is be as descriptive as you can, put the description in the FileMaker file, send the FileMaker file. If you describe exactly what you're trying to solve, many times I can turn that into a video and we can focus on that. Also, a very good uh, tip that we decided at the beginning, um, if you're following these along live and you are putting in your questions, you can prefix with a Q colon and then your question or question colon like uh, Jean-Pierre did right here. So, how can I script a popover 
to pop? Interesting question. Um, I am going to assume that you're talking about, are you talking about that right there when the, uh, the UI, when it uh, does that uh, fade in and fade out? Um, there's nothing that FileMaker gives us with regards to controls to turn that off versus turn it on. And sometimes FileMaker doesn't always show its animations. Um, I wish FileMaker was more reliable in that regard, but uh, yeah, sometimes the popover just shows up. There's so many cool things that you can do with popovers when we get to the user interface area. It'll be really fun uh, to do that. But uh, I'll have to see if there's a follow-up on that question. Um, as far as I know, to answer that one, I don't know that there is a, um, a control over that. Um, name the pop-up. Oh, um, if you want to go to the object. Yeah, HBH Group is actually, uh, if you want to, oh, I'm glad HBH Group. I'm glad you're here. Um, yeah, if you want to target an object, we can take a look at that really quickly. You can, in FileMaker, target any object by giving it a name. It's super simple. We'll go into layout mode, and there's two different ways that we can get to this popover or get, get into this popover. Um, the old way of doing it was to target an object inside of this popover, such as a field. So right now, as I double-click this field, I can see that this field is coming from portal all projects name. So if I target that field and that's the only place where it exists on this layout is in the popover, FileMaker will go into the popover and show it. But there's a better way to do it than that. But let's do it just for grins. Portal all projects name. So we will create a button right here and we will say single step, go to field and we will target or select our field did it go off screen here for me? Oh, I want this right here, target. I want portal all projects name. And we'll take a look at what happens. So there's our super simple script right there, single step. Um, and we'll call it pop, just because that's uh, what Jean-Pierre mentioned. And just see if it works. All right, so I click pop, and it's not going to it for some reason. Don't know why it's not. It should... Uh, it should be going to that name right there. Well, it does work, even though it's not uh, showing me right now. Portal all projects name. This is going to portal all projects name. So that should work. I don't know why it's not. It may be, depending on whether this is interval or not. I don't know. Let's take a look. We go to our fourth area. We look at whether the field entry is in browse mode, find mode. It is. And, uh... Don't know why it's not working. But typically, when you have on a FileMaker layout, if you have only one of an object and it's in a hidden object, such as a popover or on another tab or on a different panel than what is showing on a slider, when you go to that field, if there's only one of that field, FileMaker attempts to find it and go to that uh, switch to that hidden object, whether it's a popover, it shows it, or a field, or what have you. That's why I wanted to explain that part. Don't know why it's not working right now. It may be because it's in a portal in a popover. The test for me would be to move this outside of the popover, but I'm going to show you the best way to do this is any object in FileMaker can be named, or most any object. I can give this popover a name or I can give this field a name or this portal a name and target any one of those. If I target the popover, the popover will come up and it will have the focus, but likewise, I can target within the popover. So I'm going to target this portal right here and I'm going to give it the name of portal. I just prefix all of my objects with the name of the uh, that the object is portal, and I'm going to call this one create, because I know that this is actually, it's a create portal for me. And so here I'm going to select on this pop button, again, a single step. And instead of the go to field, I'm going to go to an object. Now this is where I have full control, because I'm going to say go to the object that is portal create. Now this one FileMaker better open up, because FileMaker knows that the only place that portal create exists, I probably need to show all of my records and click pop, is on this 
particular object. It's right here. Now the key distinction here that's important to know is had I uh, targeted the popover. So let's look at the difference here. Let's open our popover and let's give it a name in our inspector. So we'll do the same thing that I did right here. I selected this portal and chose to go to the portal with a go to object. I named it portal create as opposed to selecting the popover and choosing to call this popover projects. So let's look at the distinction because I want you to know about FileMaker. There is a distinction that is very key. When I click this pop, FileMaker didn't just go to this particular object, to the popover. It went to this particular object right here. And even though we can't see on screen, the distinction is when we go to our data viewer and we go into our watch variable, we'll create one, FileMaker has all of its get functions and we start to type in get active and there's a number of active whatever objects. So if we say get active layout object, notice that our active layout object is portal create. So this is very key when you're scripting, there are shortcuts that you can take rather than just going to the popover, then having to go to the portal or what have you, you can go directly to the object that you want if that object is disclosed or uh, um, hidden. So now if we just switch this up and uh, hide my data viewer here, and uh, this is what I love about your questions, it allows me to really explain what's going on. I'm going to now select the popover if I can select that, get the object name right there, go to my button and get my go to object and change this so that we can see the difference. This is why you're watching these videos. These are the things that will get glossed over in a lot of other beginner videos. So we click pop. Now we go take a look at our data viewer and we get our active object. And in fact, FileMaker is not returning the popover, but that's probably because the popover as a selected object, I don't know that it, it should be able to take focus. I don't know why it's not showing that, but that is the distinction. We are, we went to the popover itself as opposed to the portal. So that's a really good question. It gave me the opportunity. Um, and I'm glad that I took the time to explain that. I hope that's valuable for those of you that uh, stuck in there long enough. Always something to learn. All right. Yep learn that's that's what i love is teaching you the the all these little things that you uh learn about all right so it looks like we don't have any more questions with uh, regards to today's video i think so i think that is going to give us a wrap again if you are interested in learning more about filemaker if you're learning uh wanting if you like these little tips and you want to go even farther check out filemakermagazine.com i have a lot of content there many years of content and a lot of it is just as applicable today as it was when it was created. Things going all the way back to 2008, 2009. The core of FileMaker changes very little, if at all. The same file format has been around since FileMaker converted from FileMaker 7 to um, uh, in FileMaker 7. And FileMaker 12 was a file format change that changed back when we had a new user interface development. But 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 the core of how you solve things in FileMaker has not changed. So when you see older content in FileMaker, it's usually still applicable. So go ahead, check out the website. And um, as always, I'm going to wish you much luck with your own development. I'm going to wrap this video up. You can always put post questions over at uh, YouTube.com. There's a discussion section. You can also email them to me, at editor at FileMaker Magazine. And of course, subscribe here. You'll get notified if you click that little bell icon, use like the YouTube mobile app, what have you. And the video that will be up next will be right here. So much luck again. And until next time, happy FileMaking to you.